Hi, everyone. I will start letting you all filter in, um, but welcome to this week's textile talk. I'll let you all give you a minute or so to come in before we start our introductions here. Well, hello to everyone who's joining us. Welcome to this textile talk. This textile talk is called Seeing Myself, A Story Through Quilting with Aisha Lamoma, presented by the Modern Quilt Guild. So thank you so much for joining us today. I'm Brenna. I'm the communications manager for the Modern Quilt Guild. And today I am joined by Colleen Mullen and Aisha Lamumba. So before we start, if you have any technical difficulties during the presentation, um, please send a note in the Q&A box and I can work with you to find a solution. It is always an option to exit out of your Zoom and then log back in. We'll still be here, we'll still be talking about quilts. Um, this is being recorded, so if you miss anything in your log out, log back in, you can absolutely catch it on the recording. Um, this recording will be on the MQG resource page for members, and it will also be on the Sockwell website. So at the end of the presentation, we'll have a Q&A with Aisha, and um, so I'll pop back on for that. So if you have any questions, please do be sure to put them in the Q&A box rather than the chat box so we can get your questions asked and answered. Um, for those of you who are new to Textile Talks, um, this is a series of weekly presentations and panel discussions from fiber art organizations, including the International Quilt Museum, Quilt Alliance, San Jose Museum of Quilts and Textiles, Studio Art Quilters Associates, and Surface Designer Design Association, and us at the Modern Quilt Guild. Um, we are so thankful to be sponsored. Um, our sponsors are Orophil, Artistic Artifacts, CNT Publishing, Empty Spools Seminars, eQuilter.com, Handy Quilter, Misty Fuse, Moda Fabrics and Supplies, Nine Patch Fabrics, Quilt Mania, Schiffer Publishing, and TheQuiltShow.com. So before we actually start our presentation, how about a little information about our panelists today? So um, Aisha Lumumba is known for creating a totally out of the box, colorful textile art that ranges from landscapes to portraits and everything in between. She loves to push the envelope when it comes to the boundaries of fiber design. And I think you will absolutely see that in her work today. Aisha is nationally known for her soulful vegetarian cookbooks, but her quilting makes her famous. She was able to marry her love of quilting with her love of writing together in her books. She is a published author and now has 10 books to her credit. And to chat with Aisha, we have from the Modern Quilt Guild, our exhibits coordinator, Colleen Mullen. So without further ado, it looks like most people have joined us by now. So I would love to pass the mic over to Colleen and um, thank you all for being here. Thanks, Brenna. <clears throat> all right. So I've had the great pleasure to get to know Aisha a lot over the past month or two as we've been chatting and talking and I've spent a long time exploring her art and I'm so excited to introduce that to those of you who are new to her work. Um, so I started by posing a couple of questions to Aisha and number one got us an amazing journey. So we're gonna go over that. I just said, how did you end up where you are now? And Aisha's gonna take us through her journey. You there, Aisha? Yes. Okay. Yes. <laughs> yes. My journey started, I think, uh, when I was a little girl. Um, my favorite encyclopedia was the C Encyclopedia. Um, and I would get it every day and look up costumes. 
because I love to see mm. all the different costumes from people all over the world. Unfortunately, I never saw any costumes that reflected any people that looked like me. So that's where I started with my whole de textile um, desire to make clothes, make costumes. I had an aunt who was a seamstress, but she also made quilts. So she took me under her wing, taught me to sew. And from there, I sewed all the time, but it wasn't going to be my career. Right. As far as I knew. <laughs> <laughs> and then I, as I got older, you know, I, once I finished high school and went to Georgia State, I, I became an art major, which was very interesting. And I always say I was a very mediocre student. And um, my daughter says, why do you say that? I said, because I was. And I think I was because at that time, I didn't give myself permission to draw the images that lived inside my head. Because starting with that C encyclopedia, when you don't see yourself, it, it makes you disappear and inside. And so I think when the teacher would say, draw an inanimate object, I would see everybody go to work with their pens and pencils. And I would think of a uh, old broom in a corner with the, you know, bent bristles, or I would see my dad's old straw hat that he wore fishing. And then I would think, oh my, those are not appropriate images. Nobody wants to see those things. So I said, I don't have pictures in my head. Well, it was a lot, a lot of years later, I realized I do have pictures in my head and I have to give myself permission to do them because, because I didn't see them in art that was the, um, the art of the day or the art that was being presented did not mean they weren't worthy pictures. So that's Absolutely. why I started, um, you know, I started out with traditional quilts <laughs> and um, because that's what everybody made. Everybody made a block quilt. Mm -hmm. And um, I started making quilts when I was like about 18. I thought I wanted to make quilts at 18. Um, and my father said, okay, you're going to do that, huh? He knew something. <laughs> and I think I made maybe about 10 pieces and real 10 blocks and realized this is too slow. Um, mm -hmm. And so I put it aside, but that's where I started. Uh, when I did finally pick it back up in my 20s, um, I started doing what you see now on the screen, very traditional block patterns. Um, and that, that was my beginning. Right. And then you started really exploring, and this is where everything gets very exciting for me. <laughs> Then I decided, wow, if I can do that, maybe I can make pictures. And so I started this whole series of hat ladies, and I had no idea that this would be the, proof, the forerunner of what I would later do in terms of portraits. But when I started these hat ladies, I just did the silhouettes, and I was excited about hats and ladies in hats and I think more excited than other people were. So anyway, I went from the hat ladies and then I did the next thing, which was huh, my nature um, quilts. I, I did, we did a big uh, butterfly exhibit. And so I started doing all these butterfly quilts and then I did a few birds. That bird is the Sankofa bird. It's uh, an adinkra symbol, which means return to your past and pick up what you learned and forgot. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I did these. Um, I had a lot of fun with the butterflies, though, and I did a lot of them. So that was that, was that phase. Then I, I got excited. Everything I see excites me. 
So I said, wow, well, if I can do that, let me see if I can do people. Let me see if I can do this. I made this my exercise in movement and trying to show movement with figures. So now I have moved from just traditional blocks to actually making people and trying to show movement in, in that art. Um, from there, I went to abstracts. And because I wanted to try everything, and I did, you will see as we journey along here, I tried <laughs> everything. Every, if I saw somebody doing one thing, I said, oh, let me see if I can do that. And then before I get into that good, oh, here's somebody else doing this. So then I, I, I went back and I tried to do these abstracts. And that orange one with that big splash, it started out as a, wa a drop of water splash. And because I made it orange, when people see it, they say, oh, that's fire. So it's whatever you see. And that's what I love about abstracts is that you get a chance to imagine what you see. Then I went from abstracts into back to my traditional quilts, which was always my anchor, because I couldn't understand about art quilts. Um, what would people do with them? Quilts are for the bed. Eventually I got over that and I started making quilts for the wall. <laughs> so this, this, this little journey here was I started taking blocks and rectangles, squares, triangles. I said, I could take those and make landscapes and seascapes and just all kinds of scapes. And so this was the beginning of that. Um, then I did some more that were more um, nature. One, the first one, the waterfall, Oh, that was um, very tedious cutting out and placing all those flowers and, and leaves. And I wanted to make that waterfall look realistic. So I tried some organza fabric that I draped over the cave and then I bunched it up at the bottom so it looked like the, water, the waterfall splashing into the pond. Then the other one is a real simple landscape that you know, was my opposite of it doesn't take so much detail to still get a good idea and a good solid picture of a landscape. Next, I saw this picture. Oops. I saw this picture of, um, of a person, a face. And, you know, I had been on that journey for a little while thinking, Oh, I could do this with fabric. I could do that with fabric. And when I started my hat ladies, like I said, I never realized that I would eventually do the hats and put a face in. Um, but I started with these faces because I saw somebody else doing faces. Later, I found out it was a totally different after I developed my own little technique that what they had done was totally different from what I thought they had done. But it didn't matter because I had opened my own excitement about it. Um, right. So when I did that first one, the one with the orange flower on it, um, that was my first, very, very first attempt at doing a face. And I think the next one was the Lou Gossett one, which is of all of the faces I've done, my favorite, I think, because I think I really got the light and the fabrics right that time. Mm -hmm. um, Sometimes you hit it just right. Sometimes it's a little off. It's fun. Faces are funny because you all you see what you physically see, but you also capture the essence of the person. And if you don't get the essence of their personality, you can have every little piece of fabric exactly right, and it still won't look like the person. Um, so anyway, these are a few portraits that I have done. I've done quite a few now. Um, I'm always working on a new one, but mm -hmm. um, these are some of the, and the Aretha Franklin one is 
I don't know if it was like one of the best portraits I did or if everybody just fell in love with that hat that's covered with <laughs> sequins and beads. And when I was making that one, I started out putting these little beads and sequins on the hat. And then in about three months in and halfway, I said, what was I thinking that I was going to put all these beads on this hat? So three months in, there's no turning back. It took me about seven months just to do the hat. And a lot of people ask me that all the time. How long does it take you? Let me tell you, Aretha took a long time. How large is that Aretha quilt? It's hard to get a sense from these pictures, but how, what general size is that size, Aretha one? It's something like 40, mm, 40 by 48 or 50, something mm -hmm. like that. It's like a wall. Oh, um, nice wall hanging style. Right. That puts in perspective just how many little beads you had to put on that hat. <laughs> Seven months worth. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that was that for those. Um, mm -hmm. um, then I reached back in my mind and gave myself permission now to do the mm -hmm. images that I saw in my childhood, in my upbringing, images that I was afraid to do um, before. So the first one is one of my favorite, favorite, favorite teachers. Um, and I call that one the star teacher. And she passed not too long ago, and, and at her funeral, one of uh, the parents spoke, and he said, every day my children would come home and say, Miss Reese said do this, Miss Reese said do that, and he said, do any of your other teachers say anything? <laughs> but that's how much a favorite she was. She was the one that you talked about when you went home, the one that excited you and made you want to learn. And so that was my tribute to her. And then the other one, the two little girls, and I know they are kind of famous. They've been in a lot of exhibits traveling around. Um, but that was a picture that was influenced uh, by my sister and I when we were little girls. We would get those Easter dresses. And mm -hmm. um, they always dressed us alike, but with different colors. We weren't twins, but they treated us kind of like twins. We were close in age, but uh, I guess that was the way to keep us apart. We always had the same dress, but different colors. So and this reminds me of like that C. I always go back to in your work, the costumes that you started with in the encyclopedias and that yes. you, it looks like you've put those costumes on this quilt and that. <laughs> yes. It's just yeah, a, lot, a lot of people ask me, where did you get those little dresses? Mm -hmm. And uh, no, I made them. <laughs> that was part of my costume work, learning to make clothes first. Right. Okay. So, then these are more pictures from my childhood memory. Um, the White House was my grandmother's house. I call it Big mm -hmm. Mama's Porch because as children, we wanted to sit on that porch and we were not allowed. We could play in the yard. You're, you know, we were always told, go play in that yard, go in the back, go outside. So we all, uh, my cousins and I can attest, we couldn't wait till we got grown so we could sit on that porch. And um, that how we still have that house today in the family and we all sit on that porch. <laughs> The next one is my dad used to take us fishing with him. So my sister and I would play and run while he was fishing. And um, that place where he went fishing, uh, cows, it was in a cow pasture. So all those little patches of flowers would be where the cows had um, left their manure and those would spring up. <laughs> if you know anything about cow pastures, you know what that is. So. Anyway, we played all around it. We didn't know any better. Then the last one is uh, me and my two sisters when we were young. And on, in the background is my father and mother's store. 
we had a little store in our small town. And so this quilt is from a picture of us uh, when we were little. And that picture was a special day because I'm the one in the middle. And I remember sit, watching my sister put on that outfit and saying, I want to put on an outfit like hers. Mine looked nothing like hers. But in my little mind, I was doing the same thing she did. <laughs> and so that was a fun picture to do, a fun quilt to do. Great. And then when something gets really good to me, I make a lot of them. So, <laughs> so this one started out, the gumbo lady, I, I, it must have been really good to me because I think I have made 12, no, not 12, mm, seven of them so <laughs> far. I don't know, 12, yeah seven of them and uh, each one is um, a little different than the other one. Uh, I started exploring this, this quilt. What inspired me to do it was I was thinking about several things. First, the whole, I had heard that African people have like, when you tr in a group, like your class, for instance, everybody would wear that same fabric when they had formal occasions so that you would know that they were all a part of the same group. And it reminded me of sororities today. They have a color and a lot of the people wear those same outfits. So it kind of says something about sisterhood. So I, at sisterhood, and then I wanted to put those baskets of food in front of them. And I started seeing all these wonderful fabrics with food on them, so which made that so easy. <laughs> so that's how the gumbo ladies got started. And I also was taking a class from Marquetta at the time, and she was teaching me how to do that gentle curve across the mm -hmm. top. That's why they all have that ribbon across the top. And um, so this was my experiment with the gentle curve and several other techniques she was teaching. And then I made all of the women have the same dress. So the first mm -hmm. gumbo ladies is the one in the, on the bottom. And the subtitle of it was a little bit of this and that. And then the second one is uh, at the top left. And that was called Langyap Silver Play. And yeah, a friend of mine from New Orleans gave me that title. He says when they were little, they would always say that. And it meant... Can I have a little bit more, please? And then the purple one is almost got away. Gumbo ladies slash almost got away because that little uh, lobster was just about to get back in the water. And then the fourth one, um, the ladies with the white dress uh, and the fish on it um, means with everything. And that's what people would say. I made gumbo with everything. So that was the gumbo latest series. Then I went from beautiful. the gumbo. I'm sorry, Colleen. Oh, I said they're beautiful. Sorry. <laughs> okay, we skipped one. <laughs> we what? We skipped one. Did I? No, maybe not. Maybe my. I no. don't think so. I'm, okay. <laughs> okay, next. <laughs> You're right. Next right. we have the, <laughs> the women that fly. And this mm -hmm. series started with that first one, the blue one with the lady with those big wings. I would, mm -hmm. another excitement. Every one of these will show me I got excited about something else. Um, but I had started doing thread painting. I started seeing people doing thread painting. I was like, oh, I want to do thread painting. And so I did those wings. The wings are totally just thread. Um, mm -hmm. And so I, I I don't remember if I put the wing, did the wings first or threaded, painted it around her. I suspect I did it, uh, the wings first and then attached her to it. Can't remember now. But anyway, that was my adventure in the thread painting. And I thought when I made that one, I had so much fun with it. I'm going to make a lot of these. And I have a lot of thread. People give me thread. People give me fabric. I'm going to make a zillion of those. I made it put it up and went to the next exciting thing. Then someone asked me about doing an exhibit 
And I said, you know what? I want to do some more of these women with wings. And uh, so they said, no, we don't want that. We want some of your other really nice stuff. So I said, okay. <laughs> and I went on and started doing the women with wings because that's what I wanted to do. And I posted a few on Facebook and the person came back to me and said, I love them. I have to have these. And I... <laughs> So anyway, there you have it, uh, the women with wings. And when I start making them, they kind of start talking to me. I don't say that much, but now everybody knows the quilts talk to me, the fabrics talk to me. Um, and I just started coming up with, I decided I was going to do 20 of them. And I made a list <clears throat> of what kinds of poses that I wanted them to have. And as I started to make them, I started to notice that each one of them had a story, a story to tell. And so that's how the Women With Fly book came about, because each quote started to tell me their story. And after I ignored that for a long time, I eventually said, okay, let me just at least write this stuff down that I'm hearing <laughs> in my head. And it turned out to be a really um a nice book of stories about women overcoming different obstacles mm -hmm. so that one yeah and then three more so we have all kinds of women that fly that first one was another exercise i'm always giving myself exercise but this was an exercise in showing depth and <laughs> i really when i saw this picture and i have permission from the wonderful photographer that took it to make a quilt of it. Um, and I said, I, if I can do that, then I can really, you know, develop my whole ability to show depth. So mm -hmm. that's what that one was. The next one was um, a dancer. And I wanted to show her, her story is that she's jumping over, it's called leap, but she's leaping over all of the stress and frustration in her life in the big city. <laughs> and then the last one there is a winter walk and um, I wanted to do that patchwork quilt and now it seems like the quilt the um, coat patchwork quilt for her coat uh, mm -hmm. the coat and the wings kind of all blend in together it's hard to see it on this little scale but I had a lot of fun with that and I wanted to see what I could do with whites and shades tinted shades of white that would give you a little bit of feeling of being in that icy snow area. Mm -hmm. so that's how that one came about. Um, wow. Then I got excited again about another um, chance to make a series. So all of these are just series. I just go from series to series. So this is my Scrappy Lady series. Um, <sighs> I don't even know how to say this one got started. I was, <laughs> I was looking, sometimes I'm just searching through images. I'm just looking for an image that's going to trigger what I want to do, something new, something. And I was scaling through pictures and I said, maybe a basketball player. So I was watch, looking at all these basketball players and what they do. And this picture of this popped in my mind. And to this day, I don't know why that came in my mind from searching through basketball player pictures. But I thought of, I said, I have a gazillion scraps. So I can um, take all my scraps, put them together and make this dress, this big oversized dress and put it on a lady. So that's how this one started. And I thought when I did the first one that I would use up a lot of my scrap. It seems like that scrap bag magically refills, you know, as I empty it, more pop in. And so I don't know if I'll ever do it. I'm, I'm on number 12 of this one and I still have boxes and boxes and boxes of scrap, <laughs> but I keep trying. So these are, <laughs> these are just several of the ones that I have done in the book, the Scrap Lady book. Mm -hmm. yeah. 
And then did you say this is the one that influenced a lot of people have started making their own scrappy ladies. So you have that book and the Facebook group where they I do share have their Facebook scrappy group. ladies. Oh, thank you, Colleen. <laughs> and and I, I swear this scrappy lady has this has done everything. She's been proposed mm -hmm. to, she's danced <laughs> with her husband, she, you know, she has all kinds of really new hairstyles, head wraps, head dresses. I mean, people have really done awesome things with the pattern, which it, I am so happy that I wanted it to be something that would inspire people to try their hand at. You know, I didn't want it to be right. that you had to do just this pattern and your scrappy lady had to look like mine. But I wanted it to inspire people to do more. And mm -hmm. I think they did. I think people um, have really gone way right. out there. And some of the pictures you can you can tell that they're influenced by this and based on this. But you have just really let people let loose, and they have such personality of their own. And I think that's like really a great thing about you as an artist is that you are continually inspiring other artists, um, even if you didn't finish art school. You are. <laughs> My, my counselor said, you should do something else, you know? <laughs> so I eventually took her up on it and, and switched right. my major, but I tried. <laughs> but we're glad you came back to art. Yeah, I came back to art <laughs> way later, and, I, and I, I think art was just always there waiting for me. Mm -hmm. And uh, little did I know that would be my path. But right. uh, yeah. So the Facebook group is uh, Scrappy Ladies. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So with your influencing other people um, with the Scrappy Ladies, I think we come back to that, that other question that was so important to you as you looked in your encyclopedia and didn't see people like you. Um, so now I'm wondering if you'll talk to us about how you view your role in providing that representation to others. Yeah, yeah. I go back to that encyclopedia time. And this, mm -hmm. what, oh, for a long time when I first started quilting, I didn't, even when I started doing people, like I said, I kept the block um, traditional quilts as my base mm -hmm. um, because I wasn't sure that, I wanted children, especially my children, my grandchildren to be able to look up and see themselves. Um, when you look at art, I, you know, I think right. you should be able to look up and see yourself somewhere so that you know you belong somewhere. Um, so that's how I see myself now is doing art that young people can look up and see um, somebody with unstraightened hair or the dirt road that you live down, although mm -hmm. those places are disappearing. But I mean, something about your heritage um, right. you should be able to see. And so that I see that as what I do in art. I, I have some, I know some people who do political art, who do different things. And I think we all have our calling. And mine is to just reflect us, how we live, how we do what we do, mm -hmm. which is a lot of what we do. <laughs> right. Can you tell us um, the stories of these quilts? I loved hearing your stories about your family and your heritage that are contained in these quilts that you made. Yes. This quilt with the children on it was um, after my grandfather's funeral. It's called After the Funeral, 1943. Mm -hmm. And um, there are my two brothers and my two cousins. Um, and my family had a tradition of children wear white to a funeral. So that's how they were dressed in a funeral. And my family always says my mom always made food. So after the funeral, you know, you usually have a, rip, a repast and everybody's going to eat, but they probably had something in a bag that they could eat while everybody was waiting on food because <laughs> they both were eating something. I don't know what it was, but I, I have my idea. So yeah, that picture is from my grandfather's funeral. And um, 
the oldest, my oldest cousin, the, the tall girl that's standing there, she said she remembers coming down from uh, Pittsburgh on the train and they were all seated. And then some soldiers came on the train and they had to get up to give their seats to the uh, white people that wanted to get on the train. So that was one of the stories she told us about that trip. The other one is, I call it Aunt Clyde's house. My aunt um, Margie, she lived to be, oh, how old did I say, 99. We were hoping for 100, but she didn't quite get there. Um, but I used, I started going to visit her when she was about, well, before that. When she turned 70, I gathered all my children up and said, we're going to meet Aunt Margie because I want you all to know her. Be you know, because she's getting up in age, you know, she's getting close to, maybe she won't be here with us. Well, she lived 29 more years. They got the chance to know her very well. So, right. but um, she took me to uh, where Aunt Clyde's house was one day. Um, when I was visiting with her. I think she was about 96 then. And uh, it was all overgrown, but we, we could look through the bushes and see the house. And then she told me the story about how she and my uncle used to take the wagon, the mule and the wagon, and go to Aunt Clyde's house to get eggs for the family. And <laughs> so this was my idea of what Aunt Clyde's house must have looked like when she was a little girl. Um, quilts on the line, chickens in the yard, flowers everywhere, and a little garden, a little patch garden on the side. So mm -hmm. that was one of my childhood memories that I decided well, somebody might want to see. <laughs> we did. <laughs> um, so we talked some about your creative process. So now you're with your evolution. Um, and we always get questions about what's your creative process and yours changes with each quilt. So I'm hoping you can share with us a little bit about the differences in your creative processes um, for some of your quilts. Yes, um, and that is uh, really good. Um, wow. When I started the, the Women That Fly, and all of these are from the Women That Fly series, mm -hmm. And I think they show my creative process the most. The first one, the lady with the cotton, high cotton, I saw the cotton fabric in a uh, quilt shop. And I said, hmm, I love this fabric. I don't know what I'm going to do with it, but I better get some. So I bought a little bit, maybe about a yard. And then when I started this series, I said, I know exactly what I'm going to do with that fabric. And I didn't have enough. So um, I went online. I searched everywhere for more of it. Eventually, I found, oh, the, I remember the store I had got it at. I called them. They had one yard left. <laughs> so I took that, and then I went online. Because I used a lot, I, cut, I fussy cut the fabric. So I used a lot of it in this quilt. Mm -hmm. And I found some online also, so I got that. But this quilt was influenced or, you know, started by the fabric. Most times, though, I think a quilt starts by the idea, and then I go search for the fabric. Mm -hmm. So sometimes I get a picture in my head, and then I start searching for the fabric. Um, the second one is, uh, called, oh my, um, oh, it's called Party in the Park. <laughs> mm -hmm. And it started out as I wanted to do a quilt with, about red shoes. And I thought red shoes would be so nice. And I put, got these red shoes and then I started I'm designing the background. I knew what I wanted to do. This was another uh, practice, another uh, exercise in depth as well. <laughs> but I, I wanted to do this quilt about red shoes. And as the quilt developed, this dress took 
totally over the red shoes. You barely see this one little red shoe in the quilt, but it really became about the dress. And so, mm -hmm. and that's just how it developed. The dress just took over the whole idea of what this quilt was going to be about. And, and there was the personality, I think, of the, the lady who, the, who, you know, is the subject of the quilt. And um, yeah. And, and her wings were so different from all of the other wings I had done. Just that, that quilt there really started the whole dialogue of the stories that I eventually wrote about each one. Mm -hmm. Now, sometimes I get an idea that uh, I heard somebody say the other day, I hate it when the idea jumps on me and I can't sleep. I wake up thinking about it. I dream about it. And, and so that's, sometimes I don't have an idea. An idea will come to me and say, it's almost like the idea says, I want to be made. You know, what can you do to, to bring me into existence? And so sometimes I get those, they are not the, the, they're not the best ones I like, but they come to me like that and you have no choice. It's that muse inside that says, right that demands that you create. The last one that we have featured up here is, I knew I wanted to do this quilt, but I think it's more about mood than anything else. Mm -hmm. So, I, I, but I searched for fabrics and that, that was the whole reason I wanted to talk about this one. I found that fabric for the background because I wanted something that looked like misty, hazy, kind of, you know, because that's like a sad day to me when the, right. the fog is thick and it's misty. And so I found that fabric online and it was blue and white. And blue and white did not say what I wanted it to say. So I sat down with a nice blue marking pen, fabric pen, and I painted every little white drop <laughs> on that fabric to get that effect. So sometimes, uh, sometimes you know, you, your creative process just takes you way out. And even those, <laughs> even those things hanging down, I fuzzy cut those off of another piece of fabric and sewed them on the top of that <laughs> because I wanted that feeling of, it was two feelings I wanted there. I wanted that hazy feeling and I wanted that feeling of like isotopes in a cave or, mm -hmm. you know, like something just coming down on you. And then I found that fabric for the wings somewhere else and I was like, oh, I can make wings out of that fabric. And um, so, and the water, I searched for the water, the fabric for the water. So that came, it came like that. So sometimes it's fabric, sometimes it's an idea, sometimes it's one little shoe. I, my process, I guess my process is as all over the place as the quilts I make. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, that's, that's how I go about it. I'm always picking something and then trying to see right. if I can take the picture that's in my head and make it come onto that fabric. Right. So now I truly see myself in the quilt. And these two, <laughs> one is, the first one is called My Passion, My Peace. Mm -hmm. And this was an exhibit we did with uh, Cookie Washington in South Carolina. And she sent out the call for people to do quilts about something they are passionate about. So every day I'm working and saying, mm -hmm. what am I passionate about? And I'm sewing and I'm thinking, what am I passionate about that I can make a quilt of? So after a while it said, hello. <laughs> You are doing what you are passionate about. <laughs> right. So, so that's how I end up making that quilt with a picture of myself quilting. And I did those little 
and I know you probably noticed them in several quilts they're in both of these quilts mm. I have this is the other thing I do with my scraps I cut them in two inch squares and put them in a bag um, as, so that's as small a scrap that's what I used to say that's as small a scrap that I keep is two inches but then since I started the scrappy lady now I keep everything Right. But that was, that was, I did those two inch squares and I wanted to put that in the background. The other quilt is called a quilter's dream. And I had done those same two inch squares and I had been doing it so much that I went to sleep and dreamt about them. And I was part of the quilt. And so when I woke up, I said, I'm going to do that quilt. That's why I called it a quilter's dream. The quilter's dream is to be one with the quilt. And so she kind of blends, she's out front making a quilt, but she also is part of the quilt. So that's how that whole quilter's dream came about. Beautiful. <clears throat> and again, it's this full circle of not seeing people that look like you to now seeing literally yourself in the quilt. And I'm, I think so important to share ourselves in the things that we make. Yes. So, um, <laughs> We're going to wrap it up and take some of the questions. Brenda's going to come back and help us out with questions. But I want to thank you so much, Aisha, for talking with me over this month and letting me learn about you and your quilts. Um, you can find Aisha on her website at obaquilts.com. Um, she's on Instagram and, again, her Facebook group for the Scrappy Ladies. Um, and these are just a few of her books that we've talked about and mentioned um, with her process and the stories. And I, I highly recommend picking them up and learning more about Aisha and her work. And now we'll hand it back to Brenda for questions. Yes, I can't <laughs> wait. <laughs> um, well, so we have several questions. So we, there's a lot of questions, um, but first things first, uh, there's several questions about size. Um, so can you kind of talk about a little bit about how large your hat ladies are and how, lar how large your dancer quilt, the dancers are? Wow. Okay. Oh. Remember I said when I first started, I only did bed size quilts. I only did <laughs> big quilts because it just didn't, it, I, I couldn't make my brain understand a small quilt. I mm -hmm. mean, I was clear about like I said, pictures on the wall, but a quilt was a quilt. Um, so when I got into art quilts, I think I went, I definitely went way smaller. So most of the time they're like 20 by 30, 30 by 40, something like that. Um, now I do all kinds of sizes. I do a little 12 by 12, um, but for the most part, it depends on where it's, where it's going to go. If I think this quilt is going to be uh, in an exhibit, then I do mostly 30 by 40 up to 50 by 60, something like 50 by 60 is a really nice size for an exhibit. Um, I also now, I've been doing big bed size quilts but they are art quilts. So I went from one extreme to the other where I thought you didn't do big, big, big uh, art quilts. Yeah, but now I'm doing uh, one that's like 80 by 90, um, which is a new Harriet Tubman one and it's really big. So I do all sizes. I just am excited about doing them so it, it depends on what is on the quilt whether I, I really I think I let the quilts dictate to me how big they're going to be and or how little they're going to be and sometimes I guess the fabric that's available dictates some of that size. That makes sense that makes a lot of sense so um, I have another question from Mary who's asking um, if your quilts are three layered with the batting in between. Very good question, Mary. I'm so glad you asked that question because several people now who do art quilts 
only do the front and the back and they because they said they're just cloth paintings they're not quilts well mine are quilts i have batting in between the top side which is the decorative side and then the back side which is not usually decorative <laughs> but i do because i like that extra element of the quilt and I like that extra element of design. So I have the design that's on the front, but then you have that quilting stitch going through it, which adds more, I think. So do you, um, so I have some, I have several questions about the process that you use. Do you often sketch, do you work from a photograph? Do you often sketch out templates? Can you speak about your process of turning, um, of creating the people that you make in your art quilts. Okay. So, sometimes I start with two or three photographs. Uh, I used to sketch a lot more than I do. I love the computer. I think I, <laughs> I say I'm a computer artist. <laughs> but I used to sketch it out. And so now I think I use something between the two, sketching and working in a graphic design program but i when i a lot of times when i'm doing people if if the photograph um it doesn't isn't what has come in my mind that i want it to be then i go in a graphic design program and i move the people's arms i turn their heads i do all kinds of things until it's what i wanted it to be mm -hmm. so i kind of work between the both the picture and the computer. That makes sense. So do you, um, do you have like a particular fusible? Are you doing fusible applique on these most of the time? I do. Uh, I don't use a lot of fusible. I have to confess. I know most people do. I use a lot of pins and I stick my fingers a lot. Um, when I do use fusible, I cut like little squares and put it in spots around just to hold it until I can get it sewn down. But I don't use a lot of fusible because I know fusible has evolved over the years, but it used to just kind of gum up the needle a little bit or it makes it the stitching a little difficult. So I don't use a lot of fusible if I use it at all. For the most part, I'm a real old fashioned stick and pin lady. <laughs> <laughs> and do you use, you do machine applique or hand applique? I do both. Okay. I, it, it depends um, on what you need, right? Yeah. Just you have depends. to have all the tools in your toolbox. All the tools. <laughs> but I do, oh God, I don't even, I want to say I do hand applique most, but I don't. I just use both. I do. I, yeah. I hand, I even do a little embroidery, and I love that blanket stitch on the, on the sewing machine. So I mix it up. That's awesome. Um, so how many quilts would you say you make in a year? Oh. I, I imagine it's different depending upon the year. It's different depending on the year. It's anywhere from 20 to 35 maybe a year. Wow. I make a lot. <laughs> I'm, I'm one of those, I'm one of those hyper quilt. <laughs> like, ooh, ooh, ooh. And, and I work on more than one thing at a time. Now, I know some really very disciplined people who only work on one thing at a time. And I love them. I love to watch them. I try to figure out how their brains work. When my aunt taught me to sew, she was always working on several things. Her room we had a dress hanging on the back of the door that was the lady was coming to trial next week and she had another thing over here. And she said to me, do as I teach you, don't do as I do. And I said, okay. And I grew up and I do just as she did. <laughs> so I did, not, I did not listen to her telling me to do one thing at a time. So I'm always, I'm always working on four or five pieces at a time. That's, I mean, I, I completely relate to that as I have four projects in my sewing room in the, in the process. Um, can you tell us about the projects that you're working on right now? Wow, 
That's good. Um, wow. I have the Harriet Tubman piece that I talked about a little bit, uh, and it's big, uh, but it's a lot of pieces. So I have the background done. Now I'm just working on the person. Um, what else? Um, I started a little scrappy lady yesterday. <laughs> And I, oh, Rachel Clark has really gotten to me. And I I know I don't, I should not be working on a coat, but I have started working on a coat. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then I have one quilt on the quilting machine that, you know, when I have my quiet time, I can work on that on the quilting machine. And I have a new scrappy lady that I'm just building the blocks on. So that's just, Oh, every now and then I'll add a piece of fabric to the block. So that's, I think that's all of the ones I'm working on, I think. That sounds like a good variety, a different yeah. project for different moods. Right, yeah, or a different time of the day when the boys are asleep or when I'm, you know, Definitely. not when they are running around, so yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so um, you talk about your quilting machine. So do you have a long arm or a mid arm that you're doing a lot of your quilting on? I do have a long arm that I do most of the quilting on. And I hand quilt a lot of quilts. Um, so I, like I said, I'm always between 1920 and 2020. I'm just like, I don't know. I'm doing this by hand. I'm doing this on the machine and I'm mixing the two up and just, I want whatever the effect is I'm trying to get, I just go for that effect. But yes. That, I mean, that totally makes sense. Do, um, let's see, let me look at some other questions here. Um, let's see, Jerry is asking if you can describe your technique for doing the faces. That you've developed. Okay. Um, hmm. uh, <laughs> I'm trying to think in the best way. Like I said, I, I do a graphic art program on the computer. Mm -hmm. So usually I'll take a phase and sometimes, like I said, I take more than one phase. Mm -hmm. And it's a tricky kind of thing to blend the faces together. But sometimes I do that. And then I posterize it so that I, the highlights mm -hmm. of the lights and darks show up. And then from that, I start cutting out uh, a million tiny little pieces that I put back together. It's like, I make it like a puzzle. Okay. That's way to describe it. I make that like puzzle sense. pieces and then I put them back together. And yeah. <laughs> Most of the time it works. Sometimes it doesn't work so well because even though I might have all of the right pieces, if you don't get that shading and those colors just right, it will fail you every time. <laughs> well, fail me every time. I don't know what everybody else is doing because there, there are a lot of really good portrait quilt artists out there. Now, I remember when I first started, whew, the years have flown by. But there were only a handful of people doing it. Now, a lot of people are, you know, stepping out on that ledge and doing faces and people and things. Yeah, certainly. Is there a, um, so you, you've mentioned the, the, the graphic design, design program you use. Is there one in particular that you like a lot? Well, I use Photoshop the most. Um, I don't, I can't say it's the easiest one for me, but Maybe it's the easiest one for me because that's the one I use all the time. Um, I have messed around with Illustrator and I don't know if I've done, I might have done some other ones early on. Um, Cork Express, I don't even think it exists anymore. But <laughs> for now, mostly Photoshop. Nice. Um, so we've also had several questions about the beautiful quilt behind you. Um, oh can you <laughs> can you talk a little bit about the beautiful quilt that you're that you're sitting in front of? Well, that quilt is a scrappy lady, um, and and you can see it's pretty big. I've done about three really big ones. This one is a little bit bigger than the, what's in the book, 
So I have a really big one. I have the size that's in the book, which is more like a 30 by 40 or 50. And I, this one is easily 60 by 70 or more, no more than 70, maybe 75. So, um, but I got excited because I saw that border. I saw um, um, a picture in a quilt book of how to do it really easily because I had done it before where I cut the squares and then I put um, triangles on the outside of it and made it. And then I saw this thing where I could make it in a row and then just trim both sides of it and I would have it. So I had to try it. Why I tried it so big, I don't know, because that took me a while to make. But I don't know, the smaller probably would have taken just as long. But it was really, I was excited about doing that. So that's how that border got on the scrappy lady. Um, but I don't know. That's, that's what it is. It's a big scrappy lady. <laughs> yes. Well, inevitably, uh, there is so uh, there is so much love for you today, Aisha. Thank you so so much so for joining that. us. Um, <laughs> I will um, certainly send you a copy of the chat today because um, there's been a lot of admiration, and of course, we've run out of time for our questions. Um, but really, truly, thank you so much for joining us today. It has been a joy to chat with you. And thank you everyone who has joined us today. Um, we hope that you have been as inspired as we have been by, by Aisha's work. So um, if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to us at the Modern Quilt Guild um, or at SACWA. And again, this webinar is being recorded. You can find it on the NQG resources page for members and also on the SACWA website. So, Thank you all so much for being here and um, have a wonderful rest of your day. And thank mm -hmm. you for having me. Thank you, Colleen. You've been wonderful. Thanks, Aisha. <laughs> all right. Thank you. Thank you.